Hi everyone, welcome to this week's lecture. My, apologize, my apologies if you were hoping to see Dr. Friedman this week. Uh, unfortunately, we're all done with our lectures that she's provided um, from her class. So this week I'm gonna walk you through uh, the course material. And I think this week's lecture is one of the most interesting and one of the most fascinating because that we see a lot happening this week as it comes to this new nation and how this new nation is going to develop and also some of the problems that are going to develop between the individuals in this new nation, specifically governmental leaders. So a lot of our focus today is going to be on the politics of the new nation, political parties that develop as part of this new nation, and some of the conflicts that are going to develop as the leaders of this nation and American citizens debate what is the direction that we would like to take with this country. So. I'm hoping that at the end of this lecture, you'll have a sense of why two political parties developed, uh, a background in the first three presidencies of the new nation, Washington's presidency, the presidency of John Adams, the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, and we'll touch a little bit on the presidency of the fourth president, James Madison. Um, and then I'm also hoping that you'll have a sense of why a few things that we understand to be reality today, where did they come from when we think of American government? And you know, I think some of the information that we cover today will be very interesting to you because uh, things that we take for granted now are very much shaped during this early portion of the United States. So before getting into all of the material today, I wanted to consider some of these topics not topics, but quotations that came during the election of 1800. So in the election of 1800, you have the current president, John Adams, who is running for a second term. And if the name John Adams sounds familiar to you, it's because we've talked about him previously. John Adams was the man who defended the British soldiers who were accused of murder during the Boston Massacre in 1770. Um, John Adams was a um, delegate to the Continental Congress. Um, and so by 1800, John Adams has been elected president and he's running for re-election. At the same time that John Adams is running for re-election to the presidency in 1800, his rival for that post is Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, who's also running to be president in 1800. And the election of 1800 is considered by most historians to be one of the most um, just mean and miserable and nasty presidential elections that we've had. When this last presidential election happened in 2016, a lot of historians were sort of debating among themselves, have things got as bad as they were in 1800? And, and a lot had said no, that things were just much worse in 1800 than they were in 2016. Um, and we lived through that and know that that was kind of a, a bitter presidential election year. But 1800 was equally and probably most likely even more nasty than the election of 2016. So looking at these five quotations, the first one says, is a hideous hermaphroditical character, which has neither the force and firmness of a man, nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. And this was printed in a newspaper, and the editors of this newspaper were particularly sympathetic towards Thomas Jefferson. And so the person they're describing here is John Adams. If that phrasing the the uh, vocabulary is a little bit confusing to you essentially what this first quotation is saying is that john adams isn't a strong man but they don't even want to call him a woman because they don't even think he would make a good woman he doesn't seem to be gentle and kind and have a woman's nature so they're saying uh john adams Sure, he's a man, but he's not a man's man. And they don't even want to call him a woman because they think that would kind of be a, an insult to women. So a lot of what's happening and a lot of what's being said during this election is happening in newspapers. And newspapers at the time are dramatically different from newspapers that we're familiar with today because newspapers were largely controlled by political parties and were in the business of putting out a message that their political party supported. So you have this first quotation coming from a newspaper that supported Thomas Jefferson. The second one comes from a newspaper that supported um, John Adams, excuse me. 
And so in this one, they're talking about Thomas Jefferson, calling him a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw sired by a Virginia mulatto father. So in this quotation, they're going after Jefferson's background, saying that um, his mother was half Indian and his father was half black. Um, and so those could be pretty disastrous accusations to make against someone at that time period. And so um, you can kind of see how just nasty this election was, questioning people's backgrounds, questioning people's genders, things like that. The third one here, one of the most detestable of mankind, that was Martha Washington, the wife of George Washington, the first president, talking about um, Thomas Jefferson. She was not a fan of Thomas Jefferson. And the last quotation is again about Thomas Jefferson. Um, he has fathered five children with a slave. So this was a rumor that is put forward during the election of 800 that Thomas Jefferson had had children with a slave of his. This is something that had been talked about during the election, before the election, and after the election. And it is something that we now essentially consider to be fact, that Jefferson did have um, children with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. It's largely been proven through DNA, but there's a book called The Hemingses of Monticello. It was written by Annette Gordon-Reed. Um, and she performed her work largely before DNA evidence could cement sort of this fact. And she is actually a lawyer, and she used her lawyer training to basically work through a case proving that Jefferson did in fact have slaves with his slave Sally, Je Sally um, Jennings, that he did father children with her, Sally Hemings. He did father children with her, Sally Hemings. Um, and so this actually does appear to be true, that Jefferson was like many slaveholders who had a sexual relationship with a slave and produced children with that slave. So. I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but just so you kind of get a sense of how nasty the debate is going to be as these individuals begin to think about what is the future of the United States and what direction will the United States take. So the Constitution becomes effective in 1788. It's when a majority of the states have now passed the Constitution. They have ratified the Constitution. There is an election held in June of 1788 for the president. And 69 out of 70 votes in the Electoral College go to George Washington of Virginia. So George Washington is elected the first president of the United States. And one of those votes in the Electoral College is cast for John Adams of Massachusetts. And that was largely done because at this time, whoever got the second amount of votes in the Electoral College would become the vice president. So 69 votes were cast for Washington. One vote was cast for Adams, which would give us the first president and vice president. You have a president from the South, George Washington from Virginia, and you have a vice president from the North, John Adams from Massachusetts. So in early April of 1789, Washington leaves his home at Mount Vernon in Virginia and begins a seven-day trip to New York City, and he's going to be inaugurated in New York City. He arrives in New York City, and it takes seven days largely because travel time is slow, but he's being celebrated in many cities along the way. So he's passing through Baltimore, Philadelphia, and the residents of those cities are throwing parades for him. They're they're out on the streets to welcome him through, uh, celebrating Washington on his journey to New York City to be the president. If you're wondering why Washington is going to New York City, it's because New York City was the first capital of the United States. It's, it's settled in New York City. Eventually, it's going to become Philadelphia. If you remember reading the, the, the excerpt about Ona Judge from Erica Dunbar's book about Washington's escaped enslaved person, she escapes from the Washington's home in Philadelphia. And Washington's in Philadelphia because Philadelphia becomes the second capital of the United States. And we'll actually talk about that today, why the capital is moving and what brings the capital finally to Washington, D.C. So here is the image that we have of Washington's inauguration. Obviously, it's a painting of the event, but we do know it to be largely accurate because somebody, uh, one of the attendees actually wrote down that Washington wore a brown suit 
Um, he had white leggings on. He had a, um, I guess you could call it almost like an appel, lapel pin of an eagle on. Um, and he takes the oath of office on the balcony. This is Wall Street in New York City. And he becomes the first president. Reading the the notes left behind by one of the attendees, it sounds as though Washington was very awkward on that day. He wasn't sure what to do with his hands. His hands are awkward. He has prepared remarks. He's sort of taking them in and out of his pocket. Um, and so Washington is, is sort of on his own. He's trying to figure out what to do as president. There are debates about what to call Washington, um, whether or not his excellency is too royal, too regal. Um, if he should be referred to as uh, the president. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of different debates about how Washington should act, how Washington should carry himself. And Washington himself largely feels that debate as he tries to figure out for himself what it means to be president and how one should act as president. So Washington quickly makes two appointments. And these are pretty um, important appointments because they go about setting the tone of Washington's term as president. So Alexander Hamilton becomes his Treasury Secretary. And you've likely heard quite a bit about Alexander Hamilton because he's having his moment right now um, with Lynn Manuel Miranda's uh, musical about Alexander Hamilton. The second appointment is that of Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson is going to serve as Secretary of State. So here you have two very different individuals. Alexander Hamilton is an immigrant to the United States. He was born in the Caribbean, and he immigrates to the United States about 1776, I believe, if I'm recalling that. And he actually serves as Washington's aide-de-camp, which means he's essentially Washington's secretary during the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson um, is a wealthy man from Virginia, and he spends most of the revolution in France, serving as a connection between the United States and France during that time. So Jefferson comes back from France. He accepts Washington's um, appointment as Secretary of State. And Hamilton and Jefferson become two extremely vocal members of Washington's cabinet. And they're going to have numerous debates and numerous arguments trying to give advice to George Washington about the direction of the nation. So I really, I like this map because it shows us Washington, some of Washington's first acts. Um, this map comes from the Mount Vernon website. If you have a chance to look at that, you might enjoy it. Mount Vernon is George Washington's home in Virginia. You can still visit it today. It has been remodeled to look much of what it looked like when George Washington lived there. And so this is a map showing Washington's travels as president. And it's, it's much more than this, but I've just selected these three events. So after being inaugurated, Washington goes on what's known as a northern tour. He's going to sort of move throughout the northern states and get a sense of what they're about. Um, because the map is small, you can't exactly see it, but this kind of goes back to some of the lectures that we listened to of Dr. Freeman. When the Constitution was ratified, it had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. When Washington is elected president, Rhode Island still had not ratified the Constitution. So it was technically not part of the United States. So um, unfortunately, you can't see it, but when Washington is out on his tour of the northern states, he purposely avoids going into Rhode Island because it has not ratified the Constitution. So you can see here, he moves um, from New York City into Westchester County, then he moves in through Connecticut, and he's traveling into Massachusetts, and he, he side cuts um, Rhode Island and goes into New Hampshire. When Rhode Island does ratify the Constitution in 1790, Washington then actually makes a single trip for the purpose of visiting Rhode Island. He also takes a trip to the south to visit the southern states. And so Washington, as president, does actually uh, visit nearly every state of the Union. So one of the major proposals that comes out of Washington's term is that of his Treasury of the Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton is looking to develop 
the economy of the United States to be similar to that that one would see in Europe at this time. So Hamilton devises a plan in which these five aspects would be either sought, created, or developed as a way to strengthen the United States. A significant problem of the United States right now is debt. Many of the northern states still have debt from the American Revolution. Most of the southern states have paid off their debts. And so Hamilton's plan here is to establish the nation's credit. So to establish the nation's credit, Hamilton essentially wants to show to the world that the United States is credit worthy, that the world should be loaning money to the United States, and then that the United States is respectable enough that it's going to pay that money back. And so you're probably familiar with this now, if you have car loans or you have student loans, you are showing your credit worthy. People who are lending you money are making a decision based on your background, whether or not they think you are trustworthy enough, if you have the history to pay back your debt. And so this is essentially what Hamilton wants to do. Hamilton wants to take all the debt that the states have and put that debt together. So you're taking all the debt of the states, put that debt together and make it the debt of the United States. So the United States essentially would be going into debt with all the debt that was owed by the states. And so to pay off that debt, Hamilton wants to take loans from foreign governments, and then they would make, make payments on that debt to pay that debt off. So Hamilton wants to take all the debt of the states, put it together, and then take out loans to pay off that debt, but then you know, use those loans as a way to show that the United States has credit and it's willing to pay back its loans. The third issue that Hamilton wants to develop is the Bank of the United States. Hamilton thinks, thinks that the bank would serve the United States. In essence, this would be the Bank of the United States government. As a way to raise money, Hamilton proposes a whiskey tax. So this will be a tax on the alcoholic beverage of whiskey. But, and he also wants to tax imported goods, and he wants to provide subsidies or money for manufacturing. So if you're going to import a good, Hamilton thinks the people importing that good should pay a tax on it. And money from the federal government should be sent out to encourage manufacturing. So money from the federal government would be given to people so that there would be more manufacturing or the creation of products in the United States. So this is a five point plan by Hamilton. Establish the nation's credit by taking on debt, create a bank of the United States, put a tax on whiskey, tax all goods that are brought into the United States from foreign governments and give out government money to encourage more manufacturing in the United States. So obviously this is a pretty expansive plan and there are going to be people who are not happy with this plan. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, Thomas Jefferson is one of those people who is not happy with that plan. You're gonna notice, and I'm gonna to try to do my best, I sometimes jumble names, but you're gonna notice that when I'm talking about people, I'll give you the state that they come from. Because at this point, and, and we might actually see this now, where a person is coming from oftentimes can help us understand their point of view and what point of view they're going to take. So you have Hamilton who lives in New York and is very much within the New York City scene. Um, he's in with bankers, he's in with manufacturers. He likes this idea of a strong economy, one that's flourishing. Madison, who is from Virginia, James Madison, and his friend Thomas Jefferson, who is also from Virginia, they are farmers in Virginia. And they don't like Hamilton's plan of big time government, big time economy. They like a simple government with a simple economy focused on farming. And so when Madison and Jefferson look at Hamilton's plan, they're not thrilled with what they're seeing. As you can see here, merchants and manufacturers like Hamilton's plan because if you have a strong economy with goods coming in and out, 
That's going to be good for merchants. That's going to be good for people who have stores, people who sell things, who buy things. But it's going to be great for manufacturers. If you remember from the previous slide, manufacturers were going to be getting assistance from the government to bolster, to improve their manufacture so that they're putting out more goods and that other manufacturers are putting out goods as a way to build up the economy of the United States. So this is a plan that Madison and Jefferson do not support, and they're, they're kind of leery of it, leery of seeing the government take on such a big size in the economy, pushing farther away from agriculture. Agriculture or farming for Southerners like Madison and Jefferson is vital. They really see the future of the United States as small-time farmers spread throughout the continent, um, basically supporting the United States through the growth of crops and the sale of farm tools and farm supplies and farm products. So the big-time um, argument by Madison and Jefferson against Hamilton's plan is that it would give too much power to the federal government, the wealthy would have too much power in the government, and it would take the government, it would take the nature of the United States away from agriculture, away from farming, and put it into a, the hands of the wealthy and let the wealthy sort of lead the direction of the United States and not your small time average farmer. So Hamilton's plan actually passes, and it passes because Jefferson supposedly gets on board. Here's the story of what we have, and this story comes to us from Jefferson's journal, so we're not specifically sure if all the details here are correct, but it seems likely that this is what happened. Jefferson approached Madison and suggested that the two have dinner with Alexander Hamilton and discuss the plan. So it's during this dinner, Jefferson organizes his entire dinner. He picks out the menu, he picks out the wine, he sets out who's gonna sit where, and they, they organize a dinner. You've got Jefferson, you've got Madison, you've got Hamilton. And apparently what happens at this dinner is that Jefferson says to Hamilton, we will support your plan. We will not support number five the tax on imported goods and manufacturing subsidies. But we will support those four other things that you have going. In return for their support, it is suggested that Hamilton agreed that the nation's capital should move south. And one of the reasons why this is happening is largely because Southerners like Madison and Jefferson wanted the nation's capital in a more Southern city as a way to sort of have control over what's happening in the government. Right now, with the government, its first capital being New York, and then its second capital being Philadelphia, Southerners are afraid that the nation will sort of go in a direction that feels more Northern instead of Southern, which is meaning to say, it's more about a large scale economy that Hamilton wants instead of a small scale agricultural economy that Southerners would like. And so apparently what happens during this meeting is that Madison and Jefferson agree that they will push to have Hamilton's plan, as they have amended it, approved in Congress, if Hamilton will support the movement of the nation's capital to the South. And so both agree to this, and Hamilton's plan is approved by Congress, and Hamilton helps to secure um, support for the nation's capital to move South. And so the entire reason why the nation's capital is now in Washington, D.C. is apparently because of this deal brokered between Madison and Jefferson with Alexander Hamilton to pass Hamilton's economic program and for Madison and Jefferson to have the nation's capital in the South. So again, this information largely comes to us from Jefferson, who left this information behind in a journal. Um, but it seems likely that this is this is what happened. Most historians seem to agree that this agreement is what prompted the approval of Hamilton's plan and the movement of the nation's capital to Washington, D.C. So here you have the Bank of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and this is what the United States Bank 
was going to be sort of founded upon. The, the first bank of the United States is going to be located in Philadelphia. So it's going to be overseeing this sort of large scale economic growth that Hamilton wants. But the nation's capital is going to move south. And in the south, you have more of an agricultural flair. This is an image that comes across during that time called venerate the plow. And venerate is sort of another word for celebrate or lift up. And so when Hamilton is pushing forward with large scale economic growth, this is sort of what Jefferson and Madison want. They want small scale farmers. They want small farms producing crops and that really to be the backbone of the United States. So as we're, as we're approaching what the direction of the United States is going to be, you have people like Hamilton who say, we need strong armies, we need strong growth, we need strong economies, we need strong connections with the rest of the world. And then you have Hamilton's, Madison's, other um, most often Southern um, individuals saying, we need small farms, we need the country to expand, with uh, farmland and we need farmers to be farming on that farmland. So you can see here there's a, a big debate happening. Should the United States be more economic or should it be more agricultural? This is the first plan for Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., if you, and you're, you're likely somewhat familiar with it, it is land that was set aside by both Virginia and Maryland on the Potomac River. Um, and so this is the city of Washington, D.C. This is the plan. The plan has come up by a Frenchman, Pierre-Charles L'Enfant, who helps design the land. Um, and he gets most of his ideas from Washington. Washington actually set forth um, a lot of this planning. The nation's capital is actually not far from Washington's home in Mount Vernon. Um, so Washington basically kind of knows where the setting is going to be. He gives directions for how he wants things laid out. Um, and so this is the first plan for Washington, D.C. And we see that come apart as um, that agreement between Hamilton, Madison, and Jefferson. So with this agreement for Hamilton's plan to go into effect and the nation's capital to move more south, a new problem arises for more debate. And this one is actually going to be much more divisive. This debate is going to lead to severe divisions within this early nation. And it has to do with the French. If you recall back a few weeks ago, it was the French who provided support after the Battle of Saratoga. And it was that French support in the American Revolution that really boosted the Americans cause against England. I'm one of those people who, who really questions if the Americans could have won the American Revolution without the assistance of France. Uh, France provided a lot of military support and provided a lot of financial support to push forward with the American Revolution. So it's 1789. The Constitution has been ratified. Washington is president. In 1789, the French Revolution begins. If you're unfamiliar with the French Revolution, there is a king of France, Louis XVI, and France is in a terrible economic downturn. France has been loaning out money. It's been using money to sort of support military, um, uh, military support, one of that being the American Revolution. So there is not... Uh, enough money in France to take care of some of the needs that the French people have. And there's an uprising against the monarchy in France. Um, and although the French Revolution is a multi-year event, it's about 1791, 1792, that the French Revolution really comes to the doorstep of the United States. When France agreed to help the United States with the American Revolution, there was a treaty signed between the two that France would aid the United States and the United States would aid France in case France ever needed assistance. And so debate happens in Washington's cabinet. Should the United States assist France in the French Revolution? Jefferson says yes, the U.S. should support France. Jefferson has a very strong connection with the French. He was the ambassador to France from the United States. And so Jefferson pushes very hard for the United States to help out France. But Hamilton is against 
any assistance to the French. And as Hamilton and Jefferson are debating this idea, they're providing their ideas to Washington. And Washington comes down on Hamilton's side. And because Washington agrees with Hamilton, that becomes the position of the United States, that the United States will not become involved with the French Revolution. And Washington tells Hamilton to write up what's known as a proclamation of neutrality, that the United States will not be assisting France with the revolution and that no American citizens should be assisting France with the American Revolution. Not with the American Revolution, but with the French Revolution, excuse me. So another problem develops out of this as well, because since France is undergoing revolution, you have French citizens who are trying to get rid of the king, get rid of the queen, get rid of monarchy altogether. The other nations in Europe do not like this because this could lead to monarchies throughout Europe being overthrown. So European countries begin declaring war on France to help preserve their own monarchies. And so Britain declares war on France and America says we will be completely neutral. We are not taking sides. Because of this, the British begin impressing American ships. And this word might be unfamiliar. So essentially what the British are doing is they are stopping American ships, American ships that are sending goods to Europe to be sold. They're stopping American ships. They're taking American sailors off these ships and they're forcing the American sailors into the British Navy to fight the war against France. So essentially Britain is capturing American citizens and forcing them to fight in the British Navy in the British's war with France. So this problem of British impressment is going to last until um, Jefferson's presidency. So it's going to affect Washington's presidency, it's going to affect the presidency of John Adams, and it's going to affect the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. This becomes a significant problem, the British impressment of American ships and American soldiers, sailors. So it's the French Revolution and the debate about that that makes things so divisive that Americans begin splitting into two political parties. So our first two political parties are developed during George Washington's presidency. And these two are the Federalists and the Republicans. And there's going to be a bunch of names that you hear about these two political parties. I'll try to always use these two terms, but you sometimes might see Democratic Republicans, which is talking about Republicans. You might also see Jeffersonian Republicans, which is talking about these Republicans. Sometimes you might see Jeffersonian Democrats, which is again talking about Republicans. So it can get a little bit confusing. So I will try to always refer to either Federalists or Republicans. Federalists are typically your more wealthy citizens. They are merchants, they're lawyers. You may be a little bit confused to see farmers here because you typically would think farmers go along with Madison and Jefferson. But when I'm talking farmers, I'm talking largely about those large scale farmers. Sometimes even Southerners who have large scale plantations with numerous enslaved people could be Northerners with large scale farms that don't necessarily have slaves, but you have a type of farmer who is a little bit more wealthy, more uh, engaged with trade and commerce. And then you have the Republicans. And these are largely sort of supported by Madison and Jefferson. These are people who want small government. They want a common sense approach to government. They want common men in government. They don't like this idea of government being led by the wealthy. They really want government to feel like it's controlled by the people. So out of um, these political parties, you see numerous debates. But another issue, it seems like we're jumping from issue to issue to issue, another issue crops up that again leads to disagreement. And this goes back to Hamilton's plan when it comes to the whiskey tax. So the whiskey tax was approved by Congress. And in 1794, a tax collector is in Western Pennsylvania trying to collect the tax from the farmers. And the farmers are rebelling, saying that they are not going to pay the tax. 
And so you have a situation arising here that looks a lot like Shays' Rebellion in 1784, 5, 6. I think actually in 1786, excuse me. If you recall Shays' Rebellion, you have farmers in Western Massachusetts taking control of courts, shutting the courts down, and no legal business is happening in Massachusetts. And Shays' Rebellion was one of the tipping points for the Articles of Confederation because there was no way government could stop the rebellion. There was um, numerous actions happening that prevented shutting down Shays' Rebellion. And now, early in the new nation, there is a substantial rebellion happening, and this is going to be the test for this nation. Can this nation actually handle when there is a rebellion of its citizens against the government? So George Washington, as president and commander of chief of the military, does take a very strong um, stance on the Whiskey Rebellion. And as I've noted on the screen here, sends in 13,000 men as, as troops to squash this rebellion, of which it was very quickly squashed. And we actually have this great image of Washington surveying the troops that were sent in to put down the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794. So you now see that the federal government can be effective in stopping a rebellion of its citizens against the government. So as we move forward out of Washington's presidency, we're going to see politics, specifically the debates between the Federalists and the Republicans, really heat up and really sort of set the stage for presidential elections, but also how the new nation will develop and how the new nation will evolve. In 1796, George Washington announces that he is not going to serve another term as president. He's now served two terms as president of the United States, and he feels like that's enough. He'd like to return to Mount Vernon. And this is known as Washington's precedent, P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T. Because most presidents after Washington agree to his two-term policy. Only one, Franklin Roosevelt, serves more than two terms. He's elected to four. He dies um, very shortly after being elected to his fourth term and inaugurated. Um, and it actually now is in the Constitution, the 22nd Amendment, that a president can only serve two terms or a total of 10 years. Um, and so this is uh, something that Washington sets in motion, that, that most presidents will just serve two terms. So with Washington leaving office, the question becomes, who's going to become the new next president? So Washington's vice president, John Adams, is going to run. And John Adams is a Federalist. He's a very strong Federalist. He is basically the poster boy for the Federalist. And the poster boy for the Republicans is Thomas Jefferson. So you have the matchup now between Massachusetts John Adams and Virginia's Thomas Jefferson. And so this was a nasty political fight as the nation now has to decide really for the first time between two candidates for the presidency. As I said to you earlier, at this time with the Electoral College, whoever gets the most votes is elected the president. Whoever gets the second amount of votes is elected the vice president. That has since changed. The Constitution was amended. And now uh, presidents pick their own vice president and they run on a ticket and voters vote for a president and vice president. So um, that is that has changed. But in this time period, what ended up happening is John Adams is elected president and the man who he defeated, the man who he ran against, becomes his vice president. So you can imagine there are some heated uh, moments uh, when you're when the person you defeated becomes your vice president. Here is a map of the results of the Electoral College in 1796, and you can, as you look at this, you see pretty uh, starkly the contrast: the North voting for John Adams, the South voting for Thomas Jefferson. And so maybe you're starting to foreshadow some of the coming problems that this nation is going to consider, because there already seems to be divisions when it comes to North and South. Um, so the North is won by the Federalists. The South is largely won by the Republicans, but you'll notice here that there are some areas in the South that voted for the Federalist, John Adams. And if you recall from earlier in the semester, so we're looking at this area here. This is largely where the first settlers began to settle. And this 
is areas of sort of the old school. Um, these are where many of your large plantations are, large slave holdings. These are individuals who are growing agricultural crops, have strong connections with Europe, um, and like the idea of Hamilton's plan, like the idea of a strong economic um, United States. Here in these areas, as you start to move to the Western territories, that's where your more small scale farmers are. And so you can begin to understand why um, there are areas in the South that would support Federalists because they like the idea of a strong economy. And there are areas of the South that do not support the Federalists because they like this idea of common man government, small government, government um, largely um, focusing on agricultural pursuits and not economic pursuits. So John Adams is the second president of the United States. And the person who he defeated, Thomas Jefferson, is his vice president. Thomas Jefferson now basically asked to decide what to do. Is he going to be a vice president who supports John Adams, or is he going to be a vice president who does not support John Adams? And he largely chooses the latter. During this four years of 1796 to 1800, Thomas Jefferson is basically in the background doing whatever he can to be a thorn in the side of John Adams. Thomas Jefferson refers to the Adams presidency as the reign of witches. So you kind of hearken back to the Salem witch trials, because remember, John Adams is from Massachusetts, and he's actually not far from Salem in Massachusetts. Um, and so Jefferson sort of paints John Adams as a guy who is out of control, wants way too much from government, and will do whatever he can to sort of take whatever power he can. And in some cases, Jefferson's not wrong. John Adams is supportive of these two acts known as the Alien and Sedition Acts that passed Congress in 1798. These are two acts that really clamp down on the rights of Americans. The Alien Act allowed the federal government to deport any immigrant. And so this was largely used in cases of immigrants who had negative things to say about the government. The Sedition Act criminalized speech that was critical of the government. So this actually led to individuals in the United States being put in jail because they said negative things about John Adams. They said negative things about members of John Adams' administration. And it was these two acts that really annoyed Jefferson, really annoyed um, the power he saw that Jefferson trying, he, that he saw Adams trying to take on in the new nation. Um, and that's really where this idea of reign of witches comes from, is that the Alien and Sedition Acts are, are not good acts, and they're acts that um, kind of show the federal government under John Adams taking on way too much power. What's interesting about these acts, specifically the Sedition Act, is that the historians are really trying to figure this out, and they still haven't really come up with a great answer. If you remember, there, the Anti-Federalists really wanted a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution so that Americans' rights would be spelled out. And the First Amendment says that the government cannot prevent people's speech. And here you have an act that passes Congress, is signed into law by John Adams, that is essentially a violation of the First Amendment. But no Americans seem to raise that point, and it really kind of baffles historians why, why the case was not made that the Sedition Act was actually an, uh, unconstitutional because it limited citizens' First Amendment rights to free speech. Maybe because the government was so new, maybe it's just not something that citizens are thinking of, but it really, um, it really puzzles historians why so quickly after the Bill of Rights is added to the Constitution, that the Sedition Act would be able to be passed and not really um, fought on the grounds that it invalidated citizens' First Amendment rights. So Jefferson's pushback against the Alien Sedition Acts is to work with Madison. And Jefferson and Madison begin writing up resolutions, or essentially, I consider them maybe mini-essays, that they want state legislatures to pass. 
So Madison and Jefferson write up criticisms of the Alien Sedition Acts, and they send these resolutions to states, basically saying to the states that the federal government is trying to take on too much power and that the states should push back against the Alien Sedition Acts. But only two states were receptive to Jefferson and Madison's resolutions. You can probably guess which one. It passed in Virginia. Uh, Jefferson and Madison were both from Virginia. And it passed in Kentucky. But the other states didn't take up the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. They basically just sort of, like as I just mentioned, most other Americans overlooked the Alien Sedition Acts and sort of the way that they went about taking on power. This is a great image, I think, of this time period. This shows you the floor of the House of Representatives and a fight that breaks out in the House of Representatives between a Southern uh, member of the House and a Northern member of the House. Um, and these two basically are fighting on the floor of the House of Representatives, beating each other, one of them beating the one with his walking cane, the other one beating him with, um, these are fireplace tongs. He went and grabbed these out of the fireplace. So these are metal metal tongs that one would use to um, rearrange logs within a fire. Um, and so they're beating each other. And Matthew Lyons, the congressman from Vermont, is almost, is, is actually uh, decently injured in this fight that takes place on the floor of the House of Representatives showing us again how just brutal the politics were of this time period. So when we consider the Jefferson presidency, there are two major events that typically um, are associated with this presidency. One being the Alien Sedition Acts, which we discussed. The second being the XYZ affair. So because America had refused to help out with the American Revolution, Relationships between France and the United States are extremely strained. In fact, it looks like there might be war between France and the United States. So Tom, um, John Adams sends negotiators to France. And there's three individuals sent from the United States to France to try to negotiate less hostile relations between the two countries. So when these three Americans arrive in France, they're kind of surprised to find out that they're not going to meet with any governmental officials in the French government. In fact, they meet with three individuals who basically tell the Americans that if they're planning to meet with French government officials, they need to pay up. They're looking for a bribe. So two of the individuals come back home and write to John Adams essentially telling them what happened and why they came home. One individual, whose name is Elbridge Gary, stays behind in France to basically try to keep things moving forward with France. And that name might sound familiar to you, Elbridge Gary. Elbridge Gary uh, was from Massachusetts, and he was a pretty notable guy in Massachusetts. He'll become the governor of Massachusetts for a while. But um, Elbridge Gary's great-grandson uh, lived in New York State and eventually bought a home in Delhi, New York. And the Gary family did give money to SUNY Delhi many, many years ago. And so um, if you are familiar with Gary Hall on campus, it's named after the Gary family, of whom Elbridge Gary, uh, the great-grandfather, is involved here with the XYZ affair. So Elbridge Gary is still in France trying to kind of keep things moving. And the other two are back in the United States. And one of them writes a note to John Adams. I know I'm repeating myself here. Basically outlining what had happened. And the letter is intercepted. And the information is then made public. And so Americans get whipped up really quickly, finding out that the people sent from the United States to France to make negotiations were not even heard from. And the fact that the French asked for a bribe makes many, many Americans angry. And so a congressman actually says, the United States should be willing to pay millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. And that word tribute is another word for bribe. And so essentially what's 
this rallying cry that develops, millions for defense, not one cent for tribute, is that the United States would be willing to pay the cost of going to war to France, but will not pay one cent of bribe money to negotiate with the French. So John Adams is able to sort of negotiate a little bit more and, and send some more representatives to the point that war is avoided. So there is not going to be a war between France and the United States. But the XYZ affair really whips Americans up, makes them very angry against France, but also starts to give a little bit of support to John Adams. John Adams was becoming more and more unpopular as his presidency went about, but the XYZ affair um, did kind of bolster people's opinion of him and helped Americans to see John Adams in a different light. And this could be beneficial for John Adams because he's up for re-election in four years. He, he, remember, he is elected in 1796. And by 1800, John Adams now needs to convince Americans to re-elect him. So again, you have John Adams running to retain the presidency in 1800. But you have his vice president, Thomas Jefferson, running against him to be president. So the, the election of 1800 is between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and a couple other individuals. And this becomes important because as more individuals enter the race, the more unlikely it is that John Adams is going to actually be reelected. And so when Americans actually head to cast their ballots, John Adams um, is not even considered by most to even have a shot of winning the presidency. But the election of 1800 is one of the first major um, problems when it comes to the Electoral College for the United States. So if you look at this graphic here, you see the results of the election of 1800. You have two Republicans running, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Thomas Jefferson from Virginia and Aaron Burr from New York. You have three Federalists getting votes in the Electoral College. John Adams, um, Charles Pinckney from South Carolina, and John Jay from New York. So as you'll notice here, Adams comes in third place in the Electoral College. And there's a tie in the Electoral College between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. So whenever there's a tie in the Electoral College, it's up to the House of Representatives to vote and break the tie. So the House of Representatives begins debate and they begin voting and they just keep having tie after tie after tie. Um, and there does not seem to be any sway. Eventually, Alexander Hamilton comes out in favor of Thomas Jefferson. And this is, this is shocking because Jefferson and Hamilton were not necessarily best friends. But Hamilton trusts Jefferson more than he trusts Burr. And so by Hamilton, who's a Federalist, giving his support to Jefferson, it kind of sways some votes in the House of Representatives, which gives the election to Jefferson. And this creates a significant problem because Aaron Burr is angry. Aaron Burr is angry at Alexander Hamilton. Those two have been rivals for a while, but... Hamilton's public support of Jefferson gave Jefferson the presidency and made Burr the vice president. Because remember, whoever gets the second amount of votes in the Electoral College becomes the vice president at this time. So Jefferson is now the third president of the United States, and Aaron Burr is his vice president. Not long after this happens, as the story goes, Alexander Hamilton is at a dinner party and says something negative about Aaron Burr. That information gets back to Aaron Burr, and he challenges Alexander Hamilton to a duel. And this is, this is common in this time period in which people would settle arguments with duels, in which they would shoot at, you, shoot at each other with guns. Now, there were rules that people had were, uh, cooked up that you could get out of a duel and still save face. And even if things could not be solved and a duel happened, sometimes people would um, shoot their shot off. So they would, you know, they would miss aim or they would shoot in the air instead of shooting at the other person. But um, uh, Burr and Hamilton agree to duel. They go to New Jersey 
and they duel in 1804. And Aaron Burr, the vice president of the United States, shoots and kills Alexander Hamilton, the former Treasury Secretary. So just just consider this for a minute. A minute. The vice president of the United States has now just murdered a former member of George Washington's cabinet. So things are nuts. Things are crazy. Um, people think things are out of control now, but things were crazy then too. Aaron Burr, that's basically the end of the line for Aaron Burr. Jefferson does not want him to be vice president again when Jefferson goes for re-election. Um, so he basically gets rid of Burr. Burr goes to Tennessee for a while because he can actually be arrested in the state of New York. He tries to stay away from New York. Um, and Burr basically just fades from the limelight. He, for a while, tries to develop land out towards Mexico, um, and he's involved with some conspiracies out there. But this whole this whole election of 1800 between Jefferson and Burr really is the beginning of Burr's found, uh, downfall. So kind of an interesting story to consider uh, when it comes to these two. So as you saw from that map, I'll do it just quickly one more time. You notice that the South is almost completely aligned with Jefferson, but also New York State. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too as we consider slavery in New York State. But you see here that when it comes to the Federalist votes for Adams, it's largely in New England. A little bit of support here in the Eastern Tide of North Carolina. But Jefferson clearly has the support of the South. Jefferson is a large scale slaveholder. Um, he does, he has significant issues with slavery. He actually would like to see slavery ended, but as part of ending slavery, Jefferson thinks that slaves should just be removed from the United States, either send the slaves back to Africa or create land in the Western Territory and send all the slaves out to the Western Territory. So Jefferson has sort of some, some strange views on slavery. He actually is anti-slavery. He does not like the, the, the institution of slavery, but his getting rid of slavery just is not just not possible or feasible for him at this time period. In fact, Congress has passed its own rules in which it didn't even act on slavery because there obviously were calls to end slavery, bills coming to Congress to end slavery. And Congress actually decided for the good of the nation so that they didn't actually split up, that they just wouldn't debate slavery. And so people oftentimes wonder why Jefferson, who was anti-slavery, didn't take a more proactive view. You can kind of see um, what's going on here when Congress is actually choosing not even to discuss slavery as a way to sort of preserve the entire nation at this time period. So we'll take a look at the Jefferson presidency. I'm kind of giving it away here by giving you the dates that Jefferson is president from 1801 to 1809. So he does actually win re-election in 1804 and serve out two terms, eight years as president. To consider Jefferson as president, I always like to look at this. This is um, this is the marker for Thomas Jefferson's grave at Monticello, his home in Virginia. Uh, and that's in, his home is near Charlottesville, Virginia, sort of the western portion of Virginia. And I like this um, because this was actually written by Jefferson. Jefferson, in his will, actually stipulated what he wanted his gravestone to say. So it says, here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. So if you're reading this, you already know that one major thing is missing here. It doesn't mention that Jefferson was the nation's third president. Another thing that's missing that you might not necessarily um, recognize immediately is that Jefferson was also the governor of Virginia. So in outlining what he wanted on his tombstone, he left out governor of Virginia and president of the United States. And he didn't tell us why. He didn't say, I don't want those on here because this, this, and this. But it's, it's fascinating, I think, to myself and other historians why this would not be included. 
Um, it may be that he did not think that he had particular success during um, his time as governor and president, or it could just be that these are the things of which he's most proud. We do actually know that he is extremely proud that he helped to found the University of Virginia. The University of Virginia is still around today. It's still called the University of Virginia. You might hear discussed as UVA. Um, if you like college basketball, I, I enjoy college basketball. Um, you see Virginia oftentimes. They usually make it to the Sweet 16. Sometimes they get ahead. Um, they haven't gone to uh, the Final Four in a while. But, um, you know, the University of Virginia is still around. Uh, Dr. Freeman talked about it in her lectures because um, the University of Virginia got a little bit wild in the 1830s. And... Um, Jefferson himself had to actually kind of go there, and he brought James Madison with him um, to lecture the students and tell them to be better. And I think at one point Jefferson actually starts crying because he's so upset with um, how the students are behaving at the University of Virginia. One thing that I want to um, also mention about Jefferson before moving on, and it goes back to the beginning of this lecture, is that the election of 1800 was so brutal, was so nasty, that John Adams left Washington, D.C. the night before Jefferson's inauguration. He did not want to be in Washington, D.C. to see Jefferson inaugurated. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams had been decent friends before um, the election of 1796. And what's also a little bit more surprising is Thomas Jefferson is really good friends with John Adams' wife, Abigail Adams. They write many letters to each other. Um, but they're about to go through this period now where Jefferson's president, where Jefferson and Adams will refuse to speak to each other for about a period of 15 years. And I, if memory serves, it's Abigail Adams who kind of gets them talking to each other again. But this kind of sets up this... Um, this event here. So Adams is furious with Jefferson. Jefferson is, is angry with Adams. And so right before Jefferson takes office, John Adams begins filling many judicial um, positions with Federalist judges. So essentially what Adams is doing is he's nominating Federalists, because he's a Federalist, to be federal judges. And so that's going to be kind of problematic for Jefferson because these judges could very easily overturn policies that Jefferson wants or work against Jefferson. And so this leads to a Supreme Court case, Marbury versus Madison, which is decided in 1803. Mr. Marbury is one of those Federalist judges who was appointed by John Adams. And Madison is James Madison, who is serving as Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State. For William Marbury to take his seat as a, as a federal judge, he needs the paperwork that says he was appointed to that seat. And the person who needs to complete that paperwork is James Madison. Realizing what John Adams has done, James Madison is basically just not signing and delivering the paperwork to, to finish John Adams' plan here. So John Adams has, has filled out all the required paperwork, but this paperwork now has to be filed with the government, and you essentially need the Secretary of State to certify the paperwork. And as the Secretary of State, James Madison is refusing to file the paperwork. So Marbury sues Madison, and the case goes to the Supreme Court. And essentially what Marbury is asking for is saying to the Supreme Court, make James Madison give me the paperwork I need to take my role as a federal judge as I was appointed by John Adams. And if you look at the decision in Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court very quickly says, you know what, we actually don't have the power to decide for you, William Marbury. We're sorry, but we can't do that. But what we do have the power to do is to declare laws unconstitutional. Since you've read the Constitution, you remember that the, the, the area of the Constitution dealing with the Supreme Court is very small. It's the third of the three articles. 
and it's about two paragraphs in length. When you look at the Article One dealing with Congress, it's pages in length. Article Two dealing with the President, it's pages in length. Article Three dealing with the judicial branch, very very small. So the Supreme Court in Marbury v. Madison essentially gives itself the power to declare laws and acts of government unconstitutional. This is known as judicial review. And this is extremely consequential because the Supreme Court is continuing to use this power today. When the Supreme Court says a law is unconstitutional, it's not getting that power from the Constitution. The Constitution does not give the Supreme Court the power to do that. Where that power is coming from is this decision in Marbury versus Madison. So this happens during Jefferson's presidency, and it's something that Jefferson is very upset about. Jefferson considers himself to be a strict constructionist, which means Jefferson believes that you need to follow the Constitution exactly as written. And the Constitution did not give this power to the Supreme Court. This is power the Supreme Court gave to itself. Um, and even though this has been at times unpopular, it's never been overturned. So Marbury versus Madison continues today and it continues to give the Supreme Court the power to say that an act of Congress, an act of the president is unconstitutional. So what is great about Jefferson's response to this is that he then goes and basically um, has to make a decision in which he goes against the Constitution himself. In 1803, France, under control of Napoleon at this time, offers to the United States the opportunity to buy what's known as the Louisiana Territory. And I'll show you here. It's this territory here. This was owned by France in 1803. So it is offered to the United States, and it is offered at a very reasonable price, $15 million. And Jefferson has to decide what to do because he wants the land, but the Constitution does not give him the right to buy land. And as I just mentioned to you, he's a strict constructionalist. So he believes the Constitution has to be filed exactly as written. And so Jefferson goes against his beliefs goes against what power is actually granted him in the Constitution and agrees to purchase the Louisiana Territory. This is a dramatic decision because the Louisiana Territory doubles the size of the United States of America. So this is the United States before the Louisiana Purchase, and now this is the United States after the Louisiana Purchase. So when you think why Jefferson would likely go against his beliefs here, this very much is in line with Jefferson's beliefs. He wants the United States to be a large agricultural country. And so now look at this. This can all be farmland. This can all be land for small farmers to go west, develop little farms, and the nation continues to grow agriculturally, moving farther and farther away from places like New York and Philadelphia and Washington, where the ideas of Jefferson can flow uh, a little bit more freely. So as you probably learned in high school, um, two explorers, William Lewis and Meriwether Clark, no, Meriwether Lewis and William, oh, okay, let me just think for a second. I believe it's Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, but Lewis and Clark. They are sent by Jefferson to explore the new territory and to study what could potentially be positives for the United States. Like what is available here that the United States could use to its advantages. William and Clark become the first Americans to see the Pacific Ocean. If you remember way back to the beginning of the semester, all of those explorers were hoping to find the pathway to the Pacific Ocean. And it's Lewis and Clark that become the first. Obviously, there, there are Native Americans through here, um, and there are other explorers who will actually reach the Pacific first. But Lewis and Clark become the first um, Americans to reach the Pacific Ocean. They are guided by Sacagawea, a Native American woman they meet on the way. Um, if you look at any of those uh, gold dollar coins, Sacagawea is on those. 
And so now Louisiana territory is going to become part of the United States. France was much more liberal in its laws. And France did actually give some rights to women and slaves. And those were taken away by the United States when Louisiana becomes a state and Louisiana territory becomes territory within the United States because they're now under U.S. law. So those, those little bit of rights that had been known by women and slaves in Louisiana territory were thus decreased. This is a great, I really enjoy this. This is a page from William Clark's journal. So it was William Clark and Meriwether Lewis. I'm showing one of the species of fish that um, is observed on the trip as part of his notes about what he and Clark and those on their journey are seeing as they progress through the territory. So we have one other sort of main event of Jefferson presidency and it's the embargo. And I'm taking you back to that idea of the British impressment. Jefferson does quite a bit of work during his term when it comes to foreign relations. The um, United States had been paying ransom to Barbary pirates who had sort of set up shop off the coast of Africa. And Jefferson had decided to stop paying the ransom because um, what had been happening previously is that the United States was paying ransom to the Barbary pirates and the Barbary pirates would leave American ships alone. Jefferson stopped paying the ransom and the pirates began attack attacking American ships. Um, but Jefferson kind of fought back with them and the Barbary pirates eventually let up and stopped demanding the ransom from the United States. So now Jefferson's trying to tackle this idea of British impressment. So Jefferson suggests an embargo. And so the embargo is essentially that the United States will not import any goods from Britain. So Jefferson's hoping that this embargo is going to hurt Great Britain because they cannot sell their products in the United States. But Britain, because it's now being attacked economically by the United States, also stops importing goods from the United States. And so the United States goes into its first large-scale depression because of the embargo. Um, and so the embargo lasts beginning about 1808. And it is sort of on the mind of Americans as they're considering who's going to secede Jefferson. Because remember 1808, it's essentially the end of Jefferson's presidency. He's going to leave office early in 1809. And so as candidates are deciding um, if they're going to run for president and what they're going to run on, the embargo is sort of in the background. And the embargo begins to hurt Jefferson's popularity because Americans are hurting and suffering financially from this embargo with Great Britain. So even though Jefferson is taking a hit to his popularity, his Secretary of State, James Madison, runs to succeed Jefferson, to be the next president after Jefferson, and wins. So as part of um, Madison's campaign, he basically hints that he is going to lift the embargo if he's elected. And so James Madison, he becomes president, and he ends the embargo with Great Britain. But he kind of puts this contingency plan on it. And he says... I'm going to end the embargo with Great Britain, but if Great Britain continues to impress American sailors, American citizens, then I'm going to put the embargo right back on. So Madison lifts the embargo and almost predictably, Britain begins impressing American soldiers into the British Navy. And so the embargo comes back. And so things are getting really heated between the United States and Great Britain. In Congress, you have some congressmen saying that it's time to go to war with Britain. It's time to fight them. It's time to stop this entire system of impressment. It's time to show them that the United States is not going to deal with these attacks. So you have two loud voices saying it's time for war. One of them is Henry Clay, who's from Kentucky. The other one is John C. Calhoun, who's from South Carolina. I'm giving you these two names because these are two names that we're going to see later on. Henry Clay has a nickname known as the Great Compromiser because he's able to sort of bring North and South together. A lot of the big um, territorial disputes that are going to come about in the coming years, a lot of them get their 
get their end through compromises brought about by Henry Clay. The other John C. Calhoun is not as noteworthy as Henry Clay because he's more of a problem causer. John Calhoun um, in the early 1830s suggests that Southern states not have to follow the laws of the United States. A way is to push back against some laws of the United States that the South did not like. And so we'll talk about those two um, in the coming weeks. But for now, um, it's just good to know their names. These were two congressmen who specifically wanted to see war break out between the United States and Great Britain. These two largely support a more Republican sense, Jefferson. And then you have critics, and the critics are largely Federalists. Federalists look at this and say, people who want war with Great Britain are in it for land. And this is a really kind of a fascinating aspect here. Canada was under British control. After the American Revolution, the British continued to hold Canada. And a lot of Americans actually had this thought that Canada was just basically waiting to become part of the United States. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where that thought came from, but there were a lot of Americans who thought that if America invaded Canada, that most of the Canadians would rather be American than British. Um, and so there are some critics of Calhoun and, and Clay who say, oh, the only reason you guys want war is because you think Canada will join with the United States in response. The other area is Florida. Britain um, was allied with Spain. And Spain, I'll show you the map quickly, Spain had control of Florida. And so this was kind of problematic because here you have an ally of your enemy who's right on the border of the United States. This is the United States, this is Spain. So some of the critics of war with Great Britain are saying, oh, this is just for land. Either it's Canada's land or Florida's land. So you have this buildup of animosity between Great Britain and the United States, and it just continues to build and build and build. And there's two specific things that happen that kind of push the United States towards a war with Great Britain. So as I mentioned earlier with Jefferson, Jefferson looked at Native Americans and African American slaves as less than. Obviously Jefferson, as did almost everyone else during this time period, had extremely racist views when it came to whites and non-whites. Jefferson is, a, is an individual who thinks that Native Americans and African Americans could never fit in to American society, the white man society. And so Jefferson has two plans actually for both of them. And both of them is to um, send African Americans to the West, send Native Americans to the West, let them have their own territories out there, separate them from the United States. Obviously, he never pushes his plan for African Americans because that would mean an end to slavery. But he had always kind of thought that if slavery ever ended, African Americans would have to go out West. There was no way they'd be able to to live as free citizens in the East. So Jefferson's plan is to move Indians to territory in the Western portion of the United States. And this causes a lot of debate for Native American tribes. Some Native American tribes say, you know, we've had enough. We've had enough of the United States. Let's just take the land out West. We'll do our own thing out there and we won't be bothered by them anymore. But other Native American tribes say, no, this is our land. We're not going to continue to be pushed off of our land by the United States of America. And so you have two conflicting views within Native Americans. And this comes about here um, through two large um, individuals among Native Americans. You have the idea of the Senecas. The Senecas say, let's take the land in the West. Let's go out there. Let's educate ourselves. Let's become farmers and we'll sort of build ourselves back up, free from oppression of the United States. But another strong voice is coming from Tecumseh. Tecumseh is a member of the Shawnee tribe. And Tecumseh is saying, we need to start banding together to push back against the United States. And so he is more militant, he is more towards violence, and he would like to see Native Americans pushing back against 
the repression they're feeling by the United States of America. So here comes the tipping point. Rumors begin to spread that the British have been sort of working with the Shawnee and Tecumseh for them to support each other. And this starts to cause a sense of panic that the Native Americans would ally themselves with the British and the two would fight against the United States of America. So Madison goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war against Great Britain. Not so much about the Native American issue, but more about trade, using that as the way to push forward this. So going back to sort of how we've talked about the, the divisive nature of this time period, the southern states, which, are, which was mostly Republican, is all in for this war. The northern states, which are more Federalist, are not in for this war. This is going to hurt them. Britain is a large trading partner. The North is much about trade and economy. And by fighting with Great Britain, this is going to have a negative effect on the northern economy. So the United States goes to war with Great Britain, the War of 1812. And the United States goes to war largely divided. This is basically the South supporting this war. The North has largely been refusing to lend money to support the war plan. Um, and the War of 1812 largely becomes a war that the South supports over the North. The major event of this war happens in 1814 when British troops invade Washington, D.C. And they go to the White House. This is actually a great story. So... Um, Madison has a sense that the British troops are coming. He's watching out the windows at the White House, and he's seeing them advance on the city. So Madison takes off. He takes off on horseback. He's trying to rally some troops to push back against the British. They um, were just preparing to have dinner when Madison takes off. So the tables at the White House are set for dinner. Um, everything's ready to go. Madison's wife, Dolly, he leaves her behind at the White House. And the British troops arrive. They take control of the White House because Madison has left. Um, there's just Dolly and a couple servants there. They come in, they eat the food, and they set fire to the White House. And Dolly Madison saves this huge six-foot portrait of, of George Washington. It's, it's, a, it's a great story. She, she has the picture saved, um, but the, the, the White House is basically destroyed by the British burning it. And the British burn most of Washington, D.C., you can actually still see the burn marks on the White House now from when the British burned it in 1814. That's, that's essentially the biggest event of the War of 1812. The War of 1812 is a bunch of very, very, very small battles um, fought between the United States and Great Britain. And the war drags on for two years. It's, just, it's a back and forth war. And both sides eventually just say that they're ready to stop the war. So the war ends with the Treaty of Ghent. And both say, whatever you came in is what you leave with. So the United States gained no land and Great Britain lost no land. Kind of giving a sense of how slow news traveled during this time period. The Treaty of Ghent was, was signed in December of 1814. And the biggest battle of the War of 1812 was actually fought after the war ended. The Treaty of Ghent was signed um, in Europe. And before the treaty and news of the treaty had reached the United States, there's a battle of January 1815 um, in New Orleans led by uh, General Andrew Jackson. And that name is going to become important to us soon, um, which was the deadliest battle of the war, the Battle of New Orleans. So uh, it's kind of ironic that the Battle of New Orleans is fought after war had ended between the two. So when we look at the War of 1812, these are our major takeaways. Because most of the Native American tribes side with the British as punishment after the war, the United States basically stops being as polite. And, and you, can, you know already the United States was not very polite when it came to the Native American tribes. But really, um, after the War of 1812s, it just becomes a policy of moving the Native American tribes, getting them off their land, and not really dealing with them fairly. For the first time in over 200 years, Europe is finally at peace. There's no wars in Europe in 1815. Uh, it's not going to last long, but for a period of time, Europe finally understands what it is to be living in peace. 
now that the Americans have gone up against the British a second time and not lost, they didn't they didn't really win, but they didn't lose. Americans are really starting to feel pretty good about themselves, very patriotic, um, and the sense that maybe they finally have won independence. There was these ideas right after the revolution that how long could this really last? But the War of 1812 and the fact that they didn't lose it really kind of gave them a shot in the arm and and bolstered a sense of American patriotism and the fact that America might actually be here to stay. And if you remember, I said that the Federalist Party and the Northern states did not support the war. That basically did the Federalist Party in because Americans are feeling good about this war. They're feeling very proud about this war. And so the fact that the Federalists were against the war and didn't really do anything to help the war, that essentially ends the Federalist Party. There's no more political support for the Federalist Party. I like that. I wanted to show you this. Uh, this shows you the War of 1812, the battles. And so as you can see, it's a two year war. And there's essentially just these couple of skirmishes throughout. Blue X's mean a U.S. victory, red mean a British victory. And so even though there's more blues, really there's it's it's just such a small war when you consider it. And there's 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 historians of the War of 1812 who would want to fight me by saying that. But uh, in my opinion, it's just kind of it's it's a war to consider, but um, it's not it doesn't rank up there with other wars that we're going to see throughout this semester. The last sort of important event that comes about uh, during the War of 1812 happens uh, in Maryland at Baltimore at Fort McHenry. In September of 1814, the British are bombing the American fort, Fort McHenry. And there are residents of Baltimore who have sort of escaped and are on boats awaiting for the bombardment to end. And one of those uh, citizens is named Francis Scott Key. So Francis Scott Key is on this boat, and he's just watching these bombs go off uh, on Fort McHenry. And he writes a poem about him. And the poem goes on to become the Star Spangled Banner. And I always forget the line, but the bombs bursting in air, that's, that's from the bombardment of Fort McHenry. And sort of the pride that Francis Scott Key feels as he's watching the British bombard, but also the Americans sort of standing in solidarity against the British. So I've enjoyed talking about this with you, and I, I hope that um, this early period of the new United States is more clear to you. The major takeaways to you, I would say, is to remember this is the period in which we see the Federalist Party and the Republican Party emerge. We see the election of 1796 and 1800 be extremely divisive and really start to pit Americans against each other, now officially in parties. But it also becomes a time period in which we see extensive American growth through the Louisiana Purchase. We see the Supreme Court coming on the scene with the Marbury versus Madison decision. And we see the United States really find its footing after the War of 1812 now that it feels that it has had some successes and that it can actually stand on its own two feet.